It's great to see you this morning. We talk a whole lot about uh, trusting God, about having faith and, um, and trusting and believing in Him. And i got to tell you this morning, I believe that God has for some of us in this room a question this morning. He has a question for us this morning. It's easy to talk about it. It's easy to sing about it. Sometimes it's hard to do it. Sometimes it's hard to trust. And even more than that, we find that it's hard to entrust ourselves. It's hard to entrust our lives to to risk not being in control. To risk giving up control. And I think this morning, as we continue our study in the book of Ruth, that's what God's going to ask of some of us this morning, is to give up control, to entrust something in our life. And for some of us who don't yet have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, he's going to ask you this morning, would you entrust me with your life? Well, if you haven't been here over the past few weeks, um, some people might get bored with this kind of review of the story, but if if you didn't hear it, I mean, it wouldn't mean anything to you. And for some of us, it just helps us remember the story. So let me give you just a little bit of background. If you you have your Bible and you want to turn to the third chapter of the book of Ruth, um, if you're a guest this morning, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, My name's Art. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's been my privilege to get to... um, to uh, open God's Word for the month of July uh, through the book of Ruth. So uh, the book of Ruth takes place in, uh, in the Middle East, and some of you know that, that, boy, it's been a rough week in the Middle East, hasn't it? It's nothing new. It's nothing new. It's just the old revisited all over again. We find around 1000 B.C., between the time of Uh, Joshua leading the children of Israel across the Jordan into the promised land. Uh, He was dead and gone, and the first king, Saul, had not yet been crowned. And the book of Judges says that there was a time when people just did what was right in their own eyes. They had apathy toward God, and they were pursuing their own interests. In the town of Bethlehem, which is the town where Jesus was born, and the town of Bethlehem, the name means house of Come on, y'all, this, it, you, I need help. House of bread. And there was a famine, which is odd. In the house of bread, there'd be a famine. So we meet a family, uh, Elimelech, whose name means my God is king, and his wife, Naomi, whose name means pleasant or sweetheart. And their two sons, Malon and Kilion, and their names mean sick and dying. And th- what they do is they take off and they decide to go to the land of Moab, which was not a godly place to take your family, but they decided they would go there temporarily, and fortunately, they stayed. And Elimelech ends up dying. His two sons, Malon and Kilion, take for them wives. One of them marries Orpah. One of them marries Ruth. And then Malon and Kilion die. And so you have Naomi left with her two daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah. Uh, Naomi hears that there's food and the famine is over back in Bethlehem. So she takes her two daughter-in-laws, starts heading back. Somewhere along the way, she realizes the impact that this would have on her daughter-in-laws who are not real uh, popular among the Jewish people because they're from Moab. And uh, she encourages them to go back home again. And she asks for them. She wants them to find rest, to find husbands, to have a family, and that's what she wants for them. That's her heart's desire for them. Orpah takes off and goes back to mama and daddy's house. And uh, Ruth, on the other hand, says, I'm going with you. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. She makes a choice to follow Jehovah, the God of Israel. They arrive back in Bethlehem, creates quite a stir. But unfortunately, they still have no food. It's the time of harvest. And so we found in chapter 2 that Ruth decides, I'm going to invest here. I'm going to do something about this, whatever I can do. In Israel, they had this thing called gleaning. It was like their food pantry of the day for the people who didn't have food. 
And so people who owned farms would, were told to not just let people come and take the scraps, but actually to leave the corners of the fields so that they could come and to be generous in that. So Ruth does that. And in the middle of that, she comes to the field. Just so happens, the Bible says. But we know that nothing just so happens. But by the providence of God, she comes to the field of who? Yeah, some of you said that good. Came to the field of Boaz. You got to say it. He's a, he's a real man's man. Boaz is a godly man. In fact, when he comes to the field that day and greets his employees, he prays over them and greets them with a godly Greeting, and they greet him back with a familiar godly greeting. And so we see that his godliness, his following of God has permeated down to everyday details of his life. He notices Ruth, uh, asks who she is, and we find out that Boaz actually is some relative of Elimelech's family. And so he's heard about Ruth and her faithfulness and her loyalty to his family, and so he tells the men, don't bother her, don't harass her, in fact, bless her, let her glean from the field, and what he does is he even feeds her, and at the end of chapter two, we find that she's gone home, Naomi's found out all about this, and she's able to go and glean for the remainder of harvest in Boaz's field. And we pick the story up in chapter 3 with this question. So what happened to Boaz? We hear nothing else about him for the entire time she's harvesting. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, the harvest is over, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? The same as uh, chapter 1, verse 9, where she's, asking her daughter-in-laws to go. She wants them to have a home, a family, a husband. She wants them to have stability and security. She's asking that again, and maybe she's about to become matchmaker. Interestingly enough, that in those days, it was a heavy role of the father in finding a spouse for their daughters and even for their sons, but Ruth doesn't have a daddy to take care of her. This really struck home with me this week because I've got two daughters, one almost 14, one 17, and I'm thinking, it's coming. <laughs> and they're going to need their daddy not to be reactive, but proactive in helping them figure out what kind of man it is that God would have for them to marry. Um, it took me back to, um, I don't know if you remember, at our mission weekend, Dr. Tom Ellis spoke. And when I was in seminary, I was one of my greatest fears was is doing weddings and doing uh, pre-marriage counseling and figuring out what it is, what are the basic principles I need to teach to people thinking about getting married, especially thinking about getting married to each other. And Ruth didn't have that. All she has is Naomi. Now, now, not to sell Naomi short, better to ask a woman who's had a husband about what to look for in a husband than to ask someone who hasn't, because they don't know. And asking a woman who's had two boys growing up is probably a good place to go. But Dr. Tom Elliff, um, uh, invested in my life through a class and taught me some principles about choosing a spouse. And I just want to give them to you real quick, just in case you're trying to help somebody, or maybe you're in the market yourself. You just never know in this room this size. Number one, there's no way for you to enter into a marriage and a, a, a thing that God created and to experience it to the fullest of what God intended unless you know God and your spouse knows God. It's, it's just impossible for you to take the love of God and share it with someone else in a way that God intended unless both are actively following Christ. Really important. Number two, same, that you have the same view of marriage and divorce. 
There are so many people in our culture today who go into marriage already with an out plan. And if you're not both committed to it for life, you're in trouble. The third, vocational focus. You're good with where the other person's heading in life. Contrary to popular belief, you probably won't change them. Number four, parental blessing. Parental blessing. Having your parents' blessing on the marriage sure does make it better and easier. And parents are generally wiser than their kids, and they see things you don't see. And the fifth, if God's goal for us individually is to live for his glory, then being together should actually bring more glory to God than being apart, not less. And this is the part where in pre-marriage counseling, I just get really blunt. And I ask them, if here you are thinking and preparing to get married, and you're already doing things together that are dishonoring to God, do you think that being together is being more honoring to God than being apart? And I get real specific. And it's amazing how many people in that moment are just struck with this idea of, Oh my gosh, no one's ever asked me the question before. And I want to challenge you as you have uh, children, grandchildren, or you're in the process and the market of trying to figure out, does God want you to be single or married? I just want to encourage you with this. Put as much time in or more time in preparing for the marriage than you do for the wedding. Wedding lasts a day. Marriage, long, long, long time. So for those of you who don't have a daddy to invest in your life like Ruth didn't, I just wanted to give you just a little word. And I want to encourage you, if you're married and you have kids, grandkids, instill in them, don't be afraid to ask the question. Even at the risk of offending them or making them uncomfortable, your kids, your grandkids, it's that important. Ruth has Naomi, and here she says in verse 2, Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. She says, so what about Boaz? We know that Boaz is a godly man. He's a man of character and he's available. Now, what she's about to do next may not be the most advisable thing to give, but Naomi gives some advice, in fact, gives some direction. What we know about men is men like me are pretty dense, and sometimes we need someone just to step right in front of us and say, get our attention. And Naomi's suggesting that maybe Boaz needs someone to step in front of him and get his attention. Here's what she says. Wash, therefore, anoint yourself, and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. She says, clean up, dress up, don't wear the farm field gear, and get in his way. Not in an annoying way, but get in his way. Boaz probably hasn't seen her except all dirty and in the field. And if he had seen her, would he have even thought that this woman who we know was younger than him would have been interested in him? Verse 4. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. That'd be a dangerous thing to do with most men. Right? Dangerous thing to do. Go where they're sleeping, get under the blanket, under their feet, and, and when you startle them, say, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. I'm not saying this is advisable. I'm telling you this is what happened. <laughs> and Ruth replied, all that you say, I will do. Now, wait a minute. The advice is a little risky, but at some point, Ruth says, you know what? I'm going to entrust my future. I'm going to entrust myself 
to you and to your advice because you have my best at heart. I not only trust you, but I'm going to entrust myself to your counsel. Why is it that Naomi would give such advice? I believe it's because she not only trusted Boaz, but she was willing to entrust her daughter-in-law to Boaz. And as a parent, that's what I want for my daughter. I want to find a young man that I would be willing to entrust my daughter to, to care for her like I would care for her. Verse 6, so she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Now they'd do that because they'd afraid people would come steal it. So he's guarding his, his uh, harvest. And then she came softly. I mean, the word I'm thinking is stealth. She comes in by stealth. She uncovers his feet and lays down. Verse 8, at midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. Oh, <gasps> I can only imagine being Boaz and thinking, am I dreaming? But then I'm reminded of Hosea chapter 9, verse 1. I'm reminded of Hosea chapter 9, verse 1. And, you know, Hosea was the prophet who was asked, God asked him to take in and marry a harlot. Hosea chapter 9, verse 1 tells us what used to happen culturally here is that Harlots would go to the threshing floor and do this. And so here's Boaz. Here's what question gets me about Boaz. Was he concerned about his reputation or was he concerned about his righteousness? And sometimes guys, especially when we're, when we're making choices about how we're going to respond in what might be risky or precarious situations, I just wonder, are we more concerned about our reputation? Will someone find out? Or are we more concerned about our righteousness and whether God sees? Just asking. Verse 9, he says, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. And here's what she says, spread your wings over your servant, for you are a Redeemer. We've talked about what a redeemer can do, what a redeemer in that day was allowed to redeem back property or redeem back a slave or buy back things that were lost in the family. And she's asking him, honestly, to be the answer to his prayer back in chapter 2, verse 12, where he says that he asked God that he would cover her with his wing. And she's asking Boaz to be the answer to his own prayer. Now, I don't really recommend that women go propose to men. I think a guy ought to man up. But sometimes a guy just doesn't know that you would even be interested. So I think what she's doing here is she's proposing that he propose. Sometimes a guy just needs, you know, just a little smack across the face to say, I really am interested in you. How's he going to respond? Is he going to respond because of obligation? Well, the reality is there's somebody else who might need to respond out of obligation, but Boaz has no obligation, so any response he makes is out of a heart for her and a heart for God. He doesn't have to, but he responds. And he said, verse 10, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. How many of you guys proposed to your wife and said, may you be blessed, my daughter? Really? I mean, sweetheart, my hot baby chick, love, something. But my daughter, that just is weird. It is weird. May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. 
You, listen to what he says. You have made this last kindness greater than the first in that you have not gone after young men, whether rich or poor. He was shocked that she would be interested in him. Shocked. Sometimes the best guys don't think you would be interested in them. Verse 11. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. You are the kind of woman that any young man would be thrilled to have. And I cannot believe that you would give your love and your life to me. That's a love story right there. I think we should go down the road to Pinewood and suggest that they put it into a flick. Listen to what he says, though. He says, all that you ask, I will do. He gives her a prompt answer. Gentlemen, please do not string a lady along. Her heart is tender. If you got no intent, tell her. If you, don't, if you have intent to marry her, tell her. Don't string her along. Integrity and credibility are critical characteristics, and she knew he had them. Verse 12, and now it is true that I am a redeemer. I'm allowed to marry you. Listen to what he says. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. There's somebody else who has the right, if they want, to redeem you, to take you as his wife, to take you and care for you and to buy back the property, to, to bring you into his house. There's somebody else. And he says, I'm going to take care of it in just a minute. But, but this is one of the things that I've found experientially in relationships. Anytime, anytime that there's a relationship like this, there's going to be a barrier of some kind. Here's what impresses me about Boaz. Boaz says, I'm going to deal with it. He doesn't expect her to go deal with it. He mans up and says, I'm going to deal with it. Here's what he says then. Verse 13, remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you good, he's going to defer to what could possibly be. And he says, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then... As the Lord lives, and that's the highest vow a Jew could make. As the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. Imagine a Moabite woman who comes from a place where immorality is the norm, and she's come out to the farm area where the harlots go, and she's dressed herself up, and he doesn't want her walking back to town in the middle of the night. One of the things I love about Boaz here is that he's not just concerned about her chastity because he doesn't touch her, but what he's worried about as well is her reputation. He's worried about her reputation. Hear what he says. So she laid his feet until morning, but arose before one could recognize another, and he, Boaz, said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. I want to protect your chastity, your physical well-being, but I want to protect your reputation. Really appreciate that in him. I don't want to even give someone the opportunity to speak ill of you. Verse 15, and he said, bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city. He sent her away with more gifts. Did she need more gifts? No, but who probably had been waiting up all night long? Yeah, mother-in-law. He's one smart dude right there. Verse 16, and when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, the name he says, how did you fare, my daughter? And she told her all, all that the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley he gave me, for he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Verse 18, she replied, 
Naomi says to Ruth, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. At this point, Naomi says, okay, you've entrusted and taken risk. Now I want you to entrust and wait. I want you to entrust and wait. Why? Because she trusted the character of Boaz. She trusted his character. She trusted his integrity. He said, I'll do it. I'll take care of it. And I'm going to do it. And she tells Ruth to sit and wait. Can you imagine what that waiting party was like? But we're going to find out they didn't go send out spies to see what he did the next day. They, they just sat and they waited. Ruth entrusted herself to the counsel of Naomi, who had her best interests at heart. Naomi turns around and she entrusts Boaz to do what he would say. All the while, catch this, all the while... All of them are seeing God's sovereign hand at work. And so really when they're entrusting each other, what they're doing is they're entrusting the fact that God, the sovereign and good God, is at work in their lives and is going to work it all out. That Romans 8, 28 is actually happening and they trust him. They trust God. What's the text teach us about God? First, the thing we've been learning every week, God is sovereign and good, and he proves it. God is sovereign and good, and he proves it. Second, God will prove our character, and he blesses it. Boaz and Ruth, still had a choice on the threshing floor and God let their character be proven and as a result he blessed it third God will bless our faith but he does require it God will bless our faith but he does require faith God will move in his sovereign hand and he, he will work things out but he's going to require faith of us because we know the Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. At some point, he's going to ask you and me to entrust our life to him, to entrust our circumstance to him, and then he blesses it. What's it teach us about ourselves? Number one, we must often exhibit our faith in tangible ways. We've got to exhibit our faith in tangible ways. Sometimes he asks us to exhibit our faith by waiting. Sometimes he asks us to exhibit our faith by stepping forward. Sometimes he asks us to exhibit our faith by trusting somebody else. In any of those cases, we actually have given up control. Because real faith is never exhibited if you maintain control. And that's hard. That's hard. We exhibit tangible faith at times by entrusting others, and we exhibit tangible faith at times by taking faith-based risks. Here's one thing Naomi didn't do. She didn't say, Ruth, go to the threshing floor, find some guy who doesn't already have a girl, crawl up under the feet of his blanket, and ask him if he wants to marry you. She didn't do that. That would have been folly and foolishness. But she had faith that God was working and she had seen the character of Boaz and she entrusted that faith decision and that risk that she was asking Ruth to take in a way that exhibited faith, not foolishness. We exhibit tangible faith at times by taking faith-based risks. So I think it leaves us with two questions today. First question, how is God asking you and me to exhibit tangible faith on our journey today? 
not tomorrow, today. We know that the Bible says that we're supposed to walk by faith. So all of us will have something or have something right now working in our lives that will require faith. Sometimes it's to sit down and wait. Sometimes it's to take a step. Sometimes it's trusting somebody else. What steps are he asking you to take today? I think this is a specific question God asks us regularly. I don't think I'm just throwing it out there hoping maybe it applies to somebody. I really believe this is how God works. There's something in your life and my life that he's asking us just to trust him. And not just to say we trust him, but to entrust him with that part of our life. And I just want to give us such a challenge this morning. Why would you want to live any other way? <laughs> there's, I hadn't planned to say this. I hadn't thought about it until just now. There's, there's, there's a movie called Night and Day, Tom Cruise. My wife likes Tom Cruise movies. I think it reminds her of me, but... <laughs> Our first date was a Tom Cruise movie back in the day. Anyway, um, so, he, so he's in this movie, and he's a spy, and, he, and of course, the innocent girl comes in, and, and she's kind of wrapped into this deal, and he looks at her, and he says, your life, with me, without me, with me, without me. Here's my question. Why would you not with God, not some spy, not some he man, dude, Boaz, not, not with some capable, rich person, not with someone who has all the resources you might need, even with a doctor. Why would you not entrust your life to the creator of the universe who loves you and prove that love by giving his son to die? Why would you not? Because he proves his faithfulness in our lives. As we walk with him, he proves his faithfulness in our lives. What part of your life is he asking? What situation in your life is he asking you to entrust to him today? And finally, is God asking you this morning to entrust your soul in eternity in his son, Jesus Christ? Is he asking you this morning, you've never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, and he's asking you to entrust your life and your eternity to the one who gave all for you. It's a simple thing. It's a simple thing, and, and here's why. Boaz invited Ruth to come up under his wing. And Jesus Christ is inviting you to come up under his wing. She came to him at his invitation. And then she trusted him to do the rest. And the incredible picture there is this. Jesus Christ came and he died on a cross. And he paid the penalty for your sin, for my sin, for the sins of the world. And he says, if you would but come... And it says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He doesn't ask you to do something. He asks you to entrust him with your life. All he wants is for us to say, you know what? I can't do it myself. My sin has separated me from you, God, and I can't do it myself. I'm coming to you. Would you let me come under your wing, under your blood, under your grace, under your redemption, and I will trust you with my life. I love what he says in Matthew eleven twenty-eight: 28, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, burden, and he says, I will give you rest. 
Are you done fighting? Are you done fighting? Whatever it is, whatever step God's asking you to take this morning, I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing. And I'm going to invite you to come. And if you need to lay it down on the altar and entrust it over to God today, I want to invite you to do that. If you want someone to pray with you, there are people all over this place and I'm thrilled to get to pray with you this morning. But if you're here this morning and you don't yet have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, He's inviting you today. He's inviting you. And He's ready to do all of it if you'd but come and give yourself 